thinking outside of the box to try to solve a problem we think in a linear fashion. And magicians, we quickly figure that out. So instead of going A to B to C, we just go A to C. We kind of skip steps. And that's how we're able to do things and outwit you. And because a lot of business problems and a lot of issues we face in this world, they're not linear. They kind of go outside of the box. You need to move. You need to have the right kind of fuel in your body. And most important, sleep. When you're a business owner, you're always about trying to solve problems. You're looking for solutions. You're looking for creative sparks, sparks of genius. And those don't always come in your waking hours. A lot of them come in the middle of the night. You've got to be able to sleep and listen to yourself while you're sleeping. Welcome to another exciting episode of the podcast, The Thought Leader Revolution. I'm your host, Nikki Baloo. And boy, do we have an exciting guest lined up for you today. Today's guest is another one of our emerging thought leaders. He's the CEO and founder of Provalytics. I am speaking, of course, of none other than the one, the only, the legendary Jeff Greenfield. Welcome to the show, Jeff. Thank you so much, Nikki. It's a pleasure to be here today. It's a pleasure to have you on, my friend. So, Jeff, let's begin. Let's dive right in. Tell me your backstory. How'd you get to be the great Jeff Greenfield? Well, you know, it all started with magic, to be honest with you. You know, if you go all the way back to the beginning, uh, I think everyone gets excited about magic, and especially as a kid, but I, it just never left me. And there was something that was really cool and really exciting about it. And as I grew as a magician over time, my specialty was close-up magic. Now, this sounds kind of strange. I'm going back to the future in order to get here, but, but you'll follow along. You'll see there's a trail that goes all the way through this story. And the coolest thing about being a magician is that you're actually you're entertaining people. And what, what's the function of entertainment? Well, it's really about helping people to relax. I think it helps with stress reduction. And it also helps a lot with people being able to see, you know, that concept of being out thinking outside of the box, because people always try to figure out how did you do it? And one of the coolest things about magic is that and one of the secrets of magic is that most humans, when we tend to figure out to try to solve a problem, we think in a linear fashion and magicians, we quickly figure that out. So instead of going A to B to C, we just go A to C. We kind of skip steps. And that's how we're able to do things and outwit you. And one of the greatest things, trying to figure out how tricks are done, it, it teaches you to think outside the box think in a nonlinear fashion, because a lot of business problems and a lot of issues we face in this world, they're not linear. They kind of go outside of the box. So I did that all throughout college. And when it's time for me to go to grad school, I wanted to continue on that path of kind of helping people. And since I specialized in close-up magic, and I'd hurt my back in high school and I was seeing a chiropractor, I thought I would put the two together and go to chiropractic college. So I moved to California, uh, studied chiropractic, went to what is now the Southern California University of Health Sciences, became a chiropractor uh, and built a practice. And I thought this was going to be the end of my journey. This is what I was going to do for the rest of my life. And then just as always what happens, something comes along and changes your path. Uh, I was in practice for a number of years and then was involved in a, didn't seem like a serious car accident, but ended up crushing a nerve in my left arm and I'm left-handed. Uh, and it made it uh, almost impossible for me to take care of patients. And I, this is where I'm, I kind of faced, uh, you know, what am I going to do next with my life? What is it that I want to do? I was kind of confused about what I was going to do next. This is all I thought about doing. Now, luckily for me, when I was in uh, California and I was going to grad school, becoming a chiropractor, I was able to work at the Magic Castle in Hollywood and uh, fulfill a lot of lifelong dreams as a magician. But here I was, I was now in practice. I was back on the East Coast. I had this injury and I was confused on what I was going to do. I hired other doctors to work for me. And, and, and that didn't do it for me. I, I really wanted to be, you know, helping people and, and being in management at that time. And I, at the time I was in, my, I was around 30. It just, it wasn't fun for me. And so I decided to shut down my practice and go back on the road and become a magician again, because that's always what I knew. That's kind of how I found my center. 
So I traveled the country for a number of years doing magic, primarily in colleges and universities. When I started that path, there was this new thing called the internet that had just come out. And I really wasn't an internet user, but I knew that college students were, and that's who I was selling into, were the, the student activities council at most of these colleges. So I went out to have a website that was made and long story short, the, the company was unable to fulfill it because it was something that was new. Even though they advertised being able to make websites, they couldn't do it. And I'm like, but they did buy me a domain. It was magic-magic.com. And they handed me the registration for it and the FTP. I didn't even know what FTP was back then. And I said, well, what am I supposed to do? I've already bought ads and all these magazines with magic-magic. And they said to me, well, there's this software called Microsoft Front Page. You can go buy it at Staples. And if you can figure it out, uh, then you can you can have a website. And if you can, please please tell us how to do it because we, we need some help with it. So I was like, what the hell am I going to do? So I got in my car, drove to Staples. It was about an hour and a half away was the closest Staples. Bought this Microsoft front page. And I did something I haven't done since that time, which is I spent the entire weekend going through the entire book, doing every single tutorial. And by the end of the weekend, I had a website magic-magic.com. And so then as I was traveling to these different colleges, I was updating the website every week and people would ask me, other performers, hey, can you, you know, ah, your website updates every week. You know, can you, can you help us with this? We're looking for a webmaster. That's what it was called back then. And I would say, hey, I can help you, but this is not what I'm doing. You know, I'm on this journey to kind of find myself. I was injured and I told them my whole story. And then before I knew it, after about a year, a year and a half, I had enough consulting clients where I was able to get off the road uh, because my travel schedule was pretty pretty rough at that point. I was leaving every Sunday night, not getting back home till Thursday and not a great thing with a wife and a young daughter. Uh, so I was able to get off the road and go to the place where all consultants live, the basement of their house, uh, which uh, the only heat that I had down there was when the dryer was running. And so then I started building a consulting practice and built up, started first working on websites and then realized that clients, once they had a website, they wanted to get to the top of the search engines. So then I started one of the first SaaS SEO companies called Position Solutions, which was an automated solution to get people to the top of the search engines, taught myself how to code. And at that point, I started to get a little bored. You know, when you're used to performing several times a week in front of hundreds to thousands of people. And now you're at home in the basement, you kind of miss that rush. Uh, so I reached out to some friends in the entertainment industry and found out there was this new emerging world called product placement and branded entertainment where brands would put themselves into film and into TV. And there were some companies that were doing it, but they didn't know how to speak advertising speak. They didn't know how to talk in terms of impressions. They didn't know how to put know how to put together reports. And so I saw an opportunity there. So I reached out to some of them because they were the ones on the ground doing the work. So then I went out to start obtaining clients. And of course, I, you know, no one knew me as a product placement person, but I did know how to get to the top of the search engines. And so I hired some writers to write articles quoting me as being the expert in product placement. And then within a couple of months, Anytime anyone searched for anything in the internet about product placement, my name would come up. And so as a result, I ended up being in a lot of news stories, would speak at a lot of conferences and started obtaining clients, and then started building up a practice in product placement. Now, clients would be very excited to be in a TV or film, but they would always want more. They would say, you know, it'd be great if they could say the name of the product and hold it longer. And I would always say to clients, well, yes, you can have that but you're gonna to have to pay the production company for that. And it's gonna cost hundreds of thousands to millions of dollars. And of course, everyone would say, no, I don't wanna do that. But eventually I found some clients who are willing to do that. And that is the world of branded entertainment where you actually build out and customize entertainment for clients. And I did a lot of work uh, in the pharmaceutical industry, created a faux reality TV show called Hottest Mom in America that added about a half a billion dollars of market cap for a publicly traded company called Metasys, created a program for Verizon Wireless called How Sweet the Sound that won an Effie Award, uh, was the only uh, program that they've ever done that actually increased their exposure and their penetration in the African-American market. And then from that point, these were incredible programs. I had a blast doing them, but they would take 
six months to a year to sell in and sometimes one to three years to actually execute. But the biggest problem was, is that there was all this anecdotal evidence that we did this massive program and we saw this big shift, but there wasn't actually like Excel type measurement. And now we were moving into this emerging space of digital marketing. And there started to be all of these problems about how do you measure digital marketing in concert with traditional media, like TV and radio and print. How do these two worlds collide together? And it was this point, it was about the mid 2000s where I started creating a new platform called C3 Metrics, which was one of the first attribution platforms, which is now known as multi-touch attribution or MTA, uh, which a lot of people think that's what is going on inside of Google Analytics, but we can talk more about that. I built and scaled that company up. I exited, exited in uh, 2019, thought I would not go back to the world of measurement. After spending 12 years there, I thought it was enough. I uh, went off and actually did something really strange, which was I got a job. I actually took a job at 55, my first job ever. My wife said, why don't you try it? You've always built companies and built teams. You've never been part of one. So I did it for about a year and a half, learned a lot, but decided that it wasn't for me. It's it's really tough when you're, you're used to running your own shop to all of a sudden having a job. But there were some advantages. I learned how to enjoy weekends for the first time, understood what a Saturday was really supposed to be like. And then there were all these shifts that were happening. Uh, there seems to be this convergence of factors that's now happening in measurement that I haven't seen since the birth of digital marketing. And it created a, what I'm seeing is a major disruption in the marketplace and created a major opportunity. So I decided to do a startup again and created Provalytics, uh, which is kind of a new world approach to attribution, solving the problem a little bit differently because we're now living in this new privacy centric world. So that's kind of my journey up to this point, Nikki, in a nutshell. Heck of a journey, man. So next yeah. question is, tell me what are the problems that you and Provalytics solve for clients specifically what is it that you do that solves these problems for your clients? The biggest problem that marketers have right now is that let's say you want to go out and you want to sell something. So you're going to advertise on Facebook. Great. You're advertising on Facebook. You start to have sales that come in. Eventually, you're going to get to a point where your sales are going to flatline. Something that's called your CAC, your cost to acquire a customer, starts to go up. And the reason for that is customers and users, they... They live in all these different platforms. So Facebook's a great place to start, but then eventually you have to advertise on Google. And then you may have to do some retargeting on another platform. And then you may want to try something else. And before you know it, you're in seven or eight different types of platforms. And as you scale, this is what happens. The problem you have, though, is that there's no single source of truth telling you who brought you which customer. And the reason for that is, a customer may, may find out about you on Facebook, they may see an ad, then they may Google you and click on another ad, and then they may go to Amazon and click on an ad there, and then eventually come back to your Shopify store and buy you. And what ends up happening as you scale your media is that for every sale you have, you may have five mothers or fathers who claim credit. And that's the issue that you have is that if you have a hundred thousand dollars in sales today. When you start to aggregate and do your analysis on who brought you credit and you take down the data from all the platforms, it will tell you you had a million dollars in sales. So now someone has to do some math to figure out what's working and what's actually not working. And what ends up occurring is you make a bunch of big educated guesses on it. But the reality is that there's a lot of statistical techniques and math that has been proven to work that can help you get to a better answer. Now, I say a better answer because this is all statistical modeling and modeling is always wrong, but the whole idea is that marketing is both an art and a science. And what our platform does is help figure out that science for you much faster and in a better way. That's essentially what Provalytics does. Now, one of the issues that's going on today is that the way this used to be done several years ago, 
is that we used to use these things called cookies to connect the trail all the way together. But cookies are going away next year. And so what we used to be able to do, we're not going to be able to do. And there's all these new regulations about privacy, which changes the game. So the game is changing and it's changing more month after month. And so we need to start figuring out a different way to measure as well, too. Okay. So look, what's the dent you're seeking to make in the universe with all this? Oh, the dent is the same dent I was looking to make when I was doing magic, to be honest. And that dent is to solve people's problems, make their lives a little bit easier. The job of marketers today is, you know, they talk about being a data-driven marketer. You know, it used to be all you did was, it wasn't all you did, but you used to be able to spend your time and be creative. You used to be able to think about who's my customer. Well, my customer is Jane. Jane is 23, lives in New York City, has a dog. As marketers, we used to create these personas of who our customers were and try to get into their head and then craft really cool creative and then run focus groups and really get into that mindset. And then we would put those ads out in TV or radio or out of home. Now what's happened is those mediums are still out there, but now we've got all of these other places that we have to be because everyone's all out there. And then we have to figure out what's working and what's not working. Back in the days of Mad Men, we would put the messages out and then we would sit back and have a martini and wait three or four months. And then we would bring in mathematicians who would do an analysis to see what worked and what did, didn't. Now people are expected to have answers every day or every week. They have to put together reports for their bosses. And trying to merge all these numbers together so that they make sense is very difficult. And it's not what marketers are trained for. And it's not really what they got into this to do in the first place. They got into this to be creative, not to sling around spreadsheets. And so my job is the same as it was when I was a magician. My dent is the same as it was when I was a chiropractor. It's all about uh, stress reduction, <laughs> improving the person's health, uh, and allowing marketers to do what, what it is that they actually love to do at the end of the day. So who's your ideal client? Who's your avatar? My avatar are marketers that are spending uh, upwards of 5 to $8 million a year that are in multiple channels and are facing challenges on trying to figure out what's working and what's not working. Marketers who have ha who have, have budgets that are set and then they get calls. I mean, this is the problem of being a marketer is that it's three weeks before the end of a quarter and you get a call from your CEO who says, you have to cut spend by 90% and I need to know what you cut by five o'clock today. Oh, and by the way, the spend that you cut, it cannot impact sales this quarter. How is a marketer supposed to figure that out unless they have an advanced mathematics degree? These are the types of problems that folks have, and those are, those are the avatars that I'm looking for. Okay, so you're looking at like a chief marketing officer type of person? That's exactly right. Chief marketing officer, a VP of marketing, depending upon the size of the organization. Okay, so how are you attracting your ideal clients? Well, the way I'm doing that is through thought leadership. I've been in this space uh, since 2008. So it's about putting out the changes that are going on and the work that we're doing to adopt to those changes. Uh, unfortunately, the industry is filled with a lot of folks that don't think the sky is falling. And a lot of times it does feel like I'm, I'm chicken little screaming, the sky is falling, cookies are going to go away. And the response that we get from a lot of folks is, well, they're still here today. And the larger the organization, what ends up occurring is, is that change, you know, this is, this is how, why startups have advantages. Startups have advantages because they see a, a market opportunity and they can pivot incredibly fast because there's only three or five folks at the organization. When your organization has three or 500 or 5,000 people, you, in order to make a change like changing me uh, measurement or handling the change that cookies are gone, that can take a year to three years easily to go through. And so 
the way we're doing it is putting out marketing messages, thought leadership, uh, and uh, communication and networking with folks that we've known for years. Uh, it's interesting for me. It's fascinating right. well, for me I, 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 being let me, in this let me space. Let cut you off for a second. Yeah. Let me cut you off because you said thought right. leadership. I'm very interested because our show is all sure. about thought leadership. And quite frankly, 99% of people haven't got a clue what real thought leadership is in my experience. So how do you define thought leadership? Let's hear that. Well, there's first the medium that you utilize. And then there's second is the leadership and the thought behind it. So there's thought leadership. You can have thought leadership, which means to me that you're advancing the world that you live in. Whatever business you're in or your take on the universe, you're taking it to the next level. You're looking into the future and you're telling people, hey, this is what's happening. These are the trends that I'm seeing. And these are the things that you need to prepare for. Uh, being a thought leader means that sometimes the opinions that you have may not be rapidly accepted. They may be counterintuitive to folks that are there. And so you have to sometimes go outside of your comfort zone and it may make folks a little uncomfortable. But if you have a handle on your industry, you, you know what's coming. So that's the first aspect of thought leadership is, is having those opinions having those takes on what's going on, and then also being able to verbalize it and put it out there. All right, so the, the leading thought leader on the subject of thought leadership is an Australian fellow by the name of Matt Church. Um, he's been talking about this since the mid 90s and his definition of thought leadership is very interesting. He draws a distinction between an expert and a thought leader. He says an expert is someone who knows something, someone who understands a topic, but a thought leader is someone who not only knows something, but is known for knowing something, i.e. the people that care about what that thought leader knows about, know him, know her, for knowing about that. And not only that, they pay homage to his or her thought leadership. They listen to them, they buy their programs and products as a result of this, they um, invite him or her to come speak at their events, go to podcasts. Unfortunately, most of the people that I encounter today that go, I'm going to show you how to do thought leadership, have it confused with being an influencer, completely confused with being an influencer. So they think a thought leader is the business equivalent of the buff dude with ripped abs or the hot girl on Instagram who goes on and does something funky and cool and, 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 and eye-catching and says something that's vapid and nonsense, being candid, right? Vapid and uh -huh. nonsense. If you go right now on Instagram, on LinkedIn, on Facebook, and you see all these business gurus, they say stupid things like, um, business is all about grinding it out. Wow, that was <laughs> really deep, okay? Or our business is where it's at because we've taken the hard decisions. I'm like, really? You actually think that was thought leadership? That was the hot girl or the hot guy saying something stupid on Instagram. That's what you just did. And that's what most people are doing. I call these people influencers who pretend they're thought leaders. And I have another way of speaking about them. I call them charlatan marketers. You know, you seem like you're, I'm 55 years old. You seem like you're around my age. You understand the word charlatan. It's not in use these days among the younger folks, but basically it's a con man, a con woman, right? And they, they don't know what the hell they're talking about. The reason I wanted to have you on my show is because, well, you seem like you know what you're talking about. Like you're not full of crap. You know what I mean? You're not the ripped guy and the hot girl on the Instagram page going, hey guys, analytics are here to stay no you're not saying stupid crap like that you seem to actually be saying what you're saying but 
this definition of Matt Churches, that a thought leader doesn't just know what they know, but they're recognized and paid homage to by the space in which they know it. I'd like to get your take on that because it's a little bit different than what you said. Well, of course it is. Well, first off, I, uh, this is not the, the cast for this, but my abs, I, I, I do kind of have a two pack. I don't have an eight pack yet or six pack. <laughs> I'm working on it though, Nikki. I am. I am. I definitely oh am. So, so what I would say, I, influencers, I, influencers, right? <laughs> I'm working. I'm working towards it. I'm working towards it, Nikki. But no, I, I, You're fired, I, You're fired. <laughs> <laughs> I would agree with that definition. I think that's a great definition uh, because you, you have to have that respect in the community. And what I would tell you is, is that my group and my community, if you will, which is relatively small, when you think about the marketing community as a whole, when you think about the marketers who are my segment that I'm going after, uh, which is relatively small because most of my clients and customers are spending upwards of a hundred million or more per year. It's a very small segment. So within that group, I, I would definitely say that I'm, I'm very well known in this space uh, because of my work that I did very early on in the attribution space. Also, and not to get into too many details, but one of the problems in digital marketing is that when it first came out, it was unregulated. And I mean unregulated in terms of counting clicks and counting impressions. And there's this whole concept of viewability where in the early days, advertisers would buy ads and they would buy billions of impressions, but there was no, you couldn't tell if anyone actually saw the ad or not. So there's a whole industry that came up around fraud protection. There's two publicly traded companies, IAS and Double Verify, that came out of all of this. And there's a, an actually a nonprofit group that was set up by Congress in the 1960s called the Media Rating Council, the MRC. It's not a sexy group. It's not known. Most marketers today in the digital world don't even know who the MRC is. But the folks at Pepsi, the folks at Nestle, the larger marketers all know who the MRC is because they regulate things like TV ratings, radio ratings. And when digital first came out, there was no auditing whatsoever uh, for digital. And then they started the auditing process for digital. So my former company, C3 Metrics, we were the first attribution company to go through the MRC process to receive accreditation. So in this space, I am very well known. It's a small, small group, <laughs> but I'm definitely known in this group. How big is the CMO universe that you're speaking to? Are we talking 10,000 people, 50,000 oh, people? No, I'd say it's, I'd say it's, it's, it's around a thousand people. A in thousand the US. people? Yes. Come on, it's got to be bigger than that. There's got there's probably about companies that are uh, doing, say, fifty million in revenue and up that are spending five million and up on on marketing. I'd say there's got to be about a hundred thousand of them in, in in North America at least. I I'd say it's 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 smaller than that. There, there's there's it, it depends also the the segment that I'm going after as well. Uh, we found some some really great success in financial services. Right, right. I, that, that's a different story. You could be niching right. down to a thousand people. Right, exactly. Uh, so that's that the CMO universe of people that would potentially be interested in this, I would say is probably right. around a hundred thousand. Now, whether you're interested in them or not, that's a completely different story. Yeah, that, absolutely. And also the question is, are they feeling enough pain yet as well too? That's the other okay. question is, are they ready to make a decision? Are they? Yeah, they yeah, the I get that. The so, as, as the thought leader to the thought leaders, as the fellow who advises guys like you, um, you know, I I like what you're saying. You clearly know what you're talking about at a level that few people do. Let's be honest. But I wonder if your your nailing of the pain point is as strong as it as it ought to be. I wonder just in listening to you. Um, cause to me, let me just give you my thoughts on it. And if I'm wrong, just, sure. 
blow it out of the water. But this is what I heard in what you said that made me want to say this to you is I'm putting myself in the shoes of a CMO. The CMO is not the CEO, right? They're not the CEO. They're the CMO. They have a very particular mandate. Their mandate is grow our market share, grow our revenues, grow our sales by doing this magic voodoo stuff that you do inside the world of digital marketing, right? That's their mandate. So their heaven looks like growth and a pat on the back and a big bonus from the CEO. And their hell looks like failure and they're fired, right? Basically, they're fired. That's that's what their hell looks like, right? And I wonder, and I don't know the answer to this because I'm not in that world to the extent that you are. I wonder if you're hitting that hell hard enough for them because of what you said about, you know, that the cookies world is going away. By the way, I didn't know that until you told me. So thank you for educating me a little bit about that. But I wonder if that is a hard enough hell a hard enough hit on you on that hill because if i were advising you i'd be telling you to go on every show and leading off with cookies are about to disappear this is going to get you fired unless you adjust that would be my first five five words five sentences out of my mouth i'd be saying that and then if there was a cmo who was listening to what <laughs> like that'd be the first thing that would you know because if I was a CMO, I'd want to not get fired. I'd want to make a big bonus. I don't know. Am I wrong? Maybe I'm wrong. I don't know. But that's kind of what hit well, me. Well, no, you're right. You're right about their motivations. But here's here's the issue with scaring folks too much. Because in larger organizations, they don't like to make big changes fast. It, it tends to be a little slower. And there's also another player who is involved that works in step or sometimes counter to the CMO. And that's the CFO. That's the person who <laughs> controls the budget. And this, the CFO's complaint about the CMO, because CMOs now get hired because they say, I'm a data-driven CMO. I, I understand all about digital marketing. I can do math. And the CFO always looks at the CMO and says, yeah, you don't understand math. And so it's this balance of trying to figure out how you work between them. And then there's other, there's other uh, in larger companies, there's also analytics folks that are now there who work cross. They, they have one foot in the CFO's office. They have one foot in the CMO's office. So sometimes the folks that we're going after, and this is what I was saying earlier, is that I've been in this space. Right? Oh, yeah. And I've been Lovable. in this space long enough that I go back and I see someone got a new job. I see they're the CEO now at a company. And I go on my LinkedIn and I'm like, oh my God, I've been connected to this person since 2012. And they were uh, an analyst at an ad agency and now they're a CEO. So my contacts and people that I've networked with for years in this space, they're either CEO level or board level. And what I'm finding is for me, having conversations with them, telling them about the trends that are coming and that are going along, and then they have a conversation and then it leads to an introduction and it leads to a communication. And what I'm finding now, the biggest problem that they're having is this whole cookie shift, which is one of several changes that are going on right now. I get it. Is that their marketers, the team, the people that are actually turning the dials in the organization, this is the only way they know how to work. They don't understand that before digital, there was a way to measure without cookies, this concept called marketing mix modeling. They don't understand any other way. So there's a whole generation of marketers who have been brought up with Google Analytics and only know digital, who now have- The world is about to be thrown upside down. Right, who all have to be- Re-educated. In fact, right before I got on this call with you today, I'm putting the finishing touches on a whole attribution certification course that goes through not just the changes, but it starts historically. It talks about what it was like before digital, how we measured things, why attribution became important, what people liked about it, what they didn't, and what's going to happen. And then what 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 should you be doing as a marketer? Because 
You need to take people back to the future in order to educate them. Uh, that, at Good. least that's what I found. And it, you, you have to access where they're at and then take them backwards and in order to get them forward thinking. I'm gonna put my thought leader hat again. I had a client back in 2016, 2017, name of Matt Conway. Um, Matt had been the CEO of a couple companies and then he decided to become a, a, um, a consultant. And then now he's back to being some sort of C-suite guy again for interesting reasons. But when I started working with Matt, it was all about helping him be seen because he had the expertise, just nobody knew who he was. But Matt taught me something. And here's what he taught me. And the first uh, time we spoke, right, uh, right, the meeting where I persuaded him to sign up and become one of our members and one of our clients, he said that in his experience, one of the mistakes that a lot of consultants make is that they call on someone other than the CEO. And I said, really? He said, I said, why is that? Aren't there people that have expertises that the CEO lacks, that CEO doesn't even get what they're talking about? He goes, yeah, all that's true, and it's completely irrelevant. And I'm like, okay, why is it irrelevant? you got to explain this to me, Matt. <laughs> and here's what he said to me. He said, at the end of the day, no matter what other C-suite person you're speaking to, they have they lack a couple of key attributes that the ceo has that are determinative on whether or not you're going to get the consulting engagement i'm like do tell he said number one is the ceo has overall responsibility for the success or failure of every project in the organization and of course that makes sense and number two is that they really hate failure and they really love success and the problem with you going for a, a training course to the, you know, the chief HR officer or a marketing program to the CMO or a finance program to the CFO is at the end of the day, their number one priority is cover their butts and make sure that they don't get blamed. That's their number one priority ahead of organizational success and everything else. And they, um, they will have internal enemies. And he said what you said to me, the internal enemies, the tension. He said, the CEO does not have internal enemies. The CEO is the CEO. So if you're selling whatever you're selling, call on the CEO, sell the CEO, get the CEO to buy the pain and buy the problem and say, yeah, we're gonna work with you. And then let him direct you to the CMO or whoever the heck else it is that you got to do to get the deal done. And I've never been in the business of calling organizations your size. I call on guys like you and I call on founder, founder CEOs. I don't call on big companies without founders, right? They just, it's not my bailiwick. But I'll, I'll, I'll tell you that for the CEOs of those organizations, that has been really good advice for me. Whenever I've called on the CEO myself, I get the sale. And nine times out of that in 10, the CEO has said to me, yes, we're doing this. Now talk to this person. And for larger companies, I'll give you one other piece to kind of extend that along. Yeah. Maybe in a future podcast, you'll talk about this piece of advice that I gave you uh, that I'm happy to share, which is that in larger organizations, the CEO sometimes does have an enemy. It's his or her board of directors. Fair enough. And if you start studying how boards of directors are comprised, there's usually like the CEO is a member of the board. There's like maybe a previous CEO and a couple of other industry experts. And then sometimes there's independent board members, people that aren't experts in the industry, but they're there as an independent voice. And the problem when you start talking to people that are independent board members is that sometimes they don't have the detailed knowledge that other board members have. And if you've ever been a member of a board, you you want to contribute. That's why you're there. Uh, you know, even a nonprofit board, you want to you want to help out. That's why you're putting the time in. And so if you find one of your target accounts or a company that you want to go after and you you see that the CEO is is someone that you think would be receptive, but you haven't had any success being able to get this person on the phone or anything like that because 
or an email because they've got gatekeepers, find one of the independent board members and do a little research, find out where they live and write them a handwritten note about whatever it is your topic. You, it's got to be topical. It's got to be something that that is important. Uh, and then send them that letter uh, because I've done this numerous times and you want to time it right around the time a board meeting is. And you can research when companies have their board meetings. And I have timed it and I have found that I have gotten a CEO to reach out to me personally multiple times and they referenced the board member. The board member said, hey, you know, and 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 the reason they reach out is because at the next board meeting next month, they have to report back to that board of directors member on how did the meeting go and what ended up happening with it. So it's a way to kind of, but that's about as high as you can go at that point. <laughs> well, that's really good advice. I like that advice. When I was working with Matt Conway, he he's a, a brilliant copywriter and he would um, research the company and write uh, an email to the CEO that really hit their pain points powerfully and would get them to respond. He had an 85% response rate, which was astounding to me. Um, and for myself, if I really want a CEO, I can get to a CEO. And the main reason is for me is I've got this show. So what I do to a CEO is say, hey, so-and-so, you are one of the leading lights in this industry. Let me introduce myself. I am the host of the Thought Leader Revolution podcast, the number one podcast for thought leaders. You've been recommended to me by, and I'll mention two or three big names, as one of the leading voices in your industry. And I'm very keen on exploring this in my show for my listeners. Would you be interested in coming on my show? I'm telling you, that works pretty good. <laughs> it works pretty That's good. awesome. That's yeah. great. Yeah. and. Part of thought leadership is like, if you have your own podcast and it's all about, you know, Provolytics podcast, the analytical podcast, that could be a really interesting way for you to get prospects uh, on, on your show as well, because that opens up that opens up the no like and trust factor, right? When someone spent an hour with you or half an hour or whatever the case may be, it's a beautiful thing. So I like your knowledge. I think you're super bright. You know your stuff, obviously. I know nothing about your area of expertise, but you know your stuff. And I'm really keen on what you've said. I think marketers ought to listen to you. Uh, and I hope you don't mind that I put on my thought leader, the thought leader's hat, but I saw a few things that I thought I could contribute to you on. So I wanted to do that. No, thank you, Nikki. I loved it. The conversation's been great. It's it's always good to go back and forth, especially uh, you know, with someone who's been in business as long as we both have, it's, it's, yeah. you don't we don't get to do it as much anymore, living remote. So it's, it's a wonderful opportunity. A Amen, brother. Amen. So, um, right now for you, what would you say is the biggest challenge that, um, you face as a thought leader in having more of these people that need to know you to be engaging with you, your content and getting on your calendar and that sort of thing? I would say time. Time is always the thief of an entrepreneur uh, because there's only so much time that you have in each day. And if you want to remain healthy, you, you can't spend 24 seven doing this. I, I've tried that in the past. It doesn't work out very well. And so it, it's it's really a matter of and and of course one of the problems is is that you know a lot of the stuff that I'm doing is very you know to me it's very creative to others it may seem very nerdy but there you you have to be creative and think about it and and sometimes when you sit down and you're like okay I have five hours to get something done it's just the juices don't flow the creativity the spark isn't there. And so it's just a matter of, and for me, it's all about, you know, maintaining that balance. As long as I have that balance in life, in terms of diet and health and sleep, then things are firing where they're supposed to be. When you get even a little out of balance, that's, that's when you start to sit down and you're sucking wind and you're like, okay, I'm not making any progress here. That's actually very perceptive. So if someone's interested in finding out more about you and your work, what's the best way? for them to um, get connected with you? 
Uh, the best way is to go to provalytics.com. Uh, they can also go to jeffgreenfield.com if they want to read up more about me. Uh, but probolytics.com is the best place. And as I said, uh, by the time this airs, we'll have up our attribution certification course, uh, which folks can walk through and uh, and be able to see what it's like to where where marketing is headed and where measurement is headed as well. I, I appreciate that. We'll make sure that that goes into our show notes. I really think um, it would be really wise on your part uh, to look into a platform, which I'll send you, um, I'll send you a text about them uh, offline. They're called Podmatch. Um, basically, there's a whole lot of podcasts there that are all into the theme of marketing, uh, digital marketing, and so forth. They will get you six shows every six hours for you to to want to be on for fifty two dollars US a month. So, oh wow, dude. It's a no brainer, I think. In your case, it's a no brainer. So, you know, you don't have to obviously choose all six shows. You could choose as few or as many as you want. But I would be all over that if I were in your shoes and I would try to get onto about 100 shows in the next year uh, and spread your message. The other piece of advice that I would give you is all these things you've told me, I think you should do short five minute videos uh, on these subjects, the various sub subjects of them. I'd have a, a channel that's all about you, not Provalytics. It should be a Jeff Greenfield brand. And I would be talking about these. And I'd be talking about the future of marketing, what's going to happen, the pain for CMOs, the pain for C CEOs, the pain for CFOs. I, I were in your shoes, I'd be a guest on 100 shows and I'd put out 300 videos in the next 365 days. If you can do that, man, I think you're you're going to be thankful and you're also going to be cursing me for telling you this because you're going to have too much work on your hands. You go, How am I going to get all this done? I need to sleep once in a while. <laughs> so well, that's that's the key is is being able to do that and balance it at the same time. That's because otherwise it yeah. it's at the end, you won't be healthy enough to enjoy. No, no. But, you know, it, it's a good problem to have when everyone's seeking you out. What you're doing is really important. It's really relevant. You're a real thought leader. Congratulations on what you've created. Uh, it's, it's, it's good stuff. Thank you, Nikki. Yeah, you bet. So we wrap up by asking you to give us what we call your top three expert action steps. These are your top three pieces of advice in bullet point form that you recommend my listener take on to elevate their life and their business. So what do you say? I say, uh, number one, move slash exercise. You, you got to get up and move every day. Uh, most of us, especially business owners and leaders, we tend to spend most of our time now sitting down because many of us are remote. We don't move enough. And you, you've got to, you've got to move. You got to, you've got to exercise. I, I like very high intensity exercise. I like, I'm right now I'm I'm loving Orange Theory Fitness. It's just, it's kicking me in the butt and I nice. just absolutely love it. But you got to move. You got to move a little bit every day. Got to get in your steps, whatever it is. That's number one. Agreed. Number two is eat. The food you eat. You, you've got to eat better. It, it's the craziest thing to me that as humans, we all know that if I were to pour water into my gas tank, I wouldn't be surprised if it didn't start or didn't go very far on water because it needs gasoline to go. And yet we eat like crap and our bodies can still go. How is that? How is it they can work? Because our bodies can adapt. Our bodies are amazing engines until they're not. And so one of the things that I always recommend folks to do is one of the things that we all know we don't get enough of is fiber. So important. Just buy these damn crackers, the Metamucil crackers, take some sort of fiber thing, do something so that you can get your body working better. So you, you, you need to move. You need to have the right kind of fuel in your body. And most important, sleep. This whole idea that there was a whole movement a number of years ago where you only needed four hours of sleep. Nice. People would try these different methods. You got to have eight hours a night at least. And if you don't, you're going to be missing out on it because here's the funkiest thing is that when you're a business owner, you're always about trying to solve problems. 
You're looking for solutions. You're looking for creative sparks, sparks of genius. And those don't always come in your waking hours. A lot of them come in the middle of the night. And so you've got, there you go. Yeah, you've got to be able to sleep and listen to yourself while you're sleeping. I, I'm a big proponent of keeping a dream journal and writing down dreams. I think last night I had two dreams. I woke up twice in the middle of the night to write them down. So my three things are uh, move, have better fuel in your body, and sleep. You know, I, take care I, of those I, things. You're going to be in great shape. I, I I can't agree with you more. Um, I used to be a top fitness coach. I worked with Olympic champions. I worked with billionaires. I worked with top performers in all areas of life. Until my mid 40s, I was one of the fittest men on the planet. And in my mid 40s, I, I got out of that world. So I'd been a corporate guy and then I did that for about a dozen years. And a switch flipped in my head and I just didn't take it as seriously. And I justified it by telling myself, hey, you got this, man. This is no big deal. You'll turn it around. Anyways, 12 years later, flash forward, I've gained close to 50 pounds. I look at myself in the mirror and I'm disgusted with myself, right? Because I've got mm. pictures of me like stacked, jacked, juiced right. up, uh, you, you know. And so I made a decision on Feb 7th of this year that I was going to shift this like no kidding. And I, and I also realized, I told myself, you're not a top trainer anymore. Hire somebody. So I hired a coach and the guy that I hired, I hired him because he'd had a reputation of working with people our age and getting them into bodybuilding contest shape. So I called him up and I said, Hey, is this true? Can you do this for me? He said, yes. I said, you're hired. I hadn't asked him what was involved. I hadn't asked him his fee, nothing. I just said, you're hired. Let's go. And I said, how do you work? How do you charge me and all that? So he told me, I said, no problem. Here's a credit card. Let's get going. And anyways, long story short is I was 227 on Feb 7th. Um, I'm 184 today. Uh, wow. Yeah. Congratulations. Yeah. That's it's, a awesome. big, it's a big result for a 55-year-old man to achieve. And our goal is to get down to 180. So I'm getting close. I think I'll be there in a couple of weeks. Uh, and the other thing is that sleep. I interviewed Lieutenant Colonel David Grossman, U.S. Army Rangers retired on my podcast in December. You ought to listen to that episode. I'll, I'll, um, I'll text it to you. Uh, okay. He is a brilliant thought leader. Now, he's, he's, he's a veteran, obviously, but his thought leadership, what made him famous was that in the 90s, he wrote a book called On Killing, which was a detailed study of the impact of taking human life on members of the military and law enforcement, right? What that did to them as, as human beings. That book sold a million copies worldwide, and he became the in-demand speaker, lecturer at West Point, at Virginia Military Institute, at Quantico for the FBI, and places all over the United States, the world, and then he wrote on combat, on spiritual combat. He wrote a whole bunch of books. So he came on my show and he's talking about sleep and sleep deprivation, the impact of this on military law enforcement, because that's his world, but also on humanity in general. And I'm listening to him and I'm going, oh, wow, what he's saying about this is what it's like when you're sleep deprived. I go, that's me. Like he's talking about this. I'm going, that's me. I'm sleep deprived. Oh, I was just thinking I was getting old. No, I'm not getting old. I'm sleep deprived. I'm sleep deprived. And anyways, long story short is in, at the end of his monologue on sleep deprivation, I said, I think I know what your next book's going to be. He said, oh, yeah, what? I said, it's going to be called On Sleep and I'm going to be your co-author. And he said, interesting, because I've written a bunch of books. I've written like 10 books. And um, anyways, long story short is I'm in the, I, I now have a, partnership with Colonel Grossman. We're going to write this book. We're negotiating with, uh, with a publisher. And man, I'm excited to write it. That's, but that's I'm great. Also... How, many, how many hours did you get last night? So last night was not one of my better nights. It was six and a half hours. Um, I went to bed at a, at a good time, but I have two teenage sons. 
and they did not go to bed at a good time and they kept that up <laughs> you know what am i going to tell you they are no, that's, time that's, that's, and it's i got i got i got seven last night i was in bed at a good time but then i started reading something on my kindle and i got sucked into it and so oh I so colonel morning, so Colonel Grossman made me get rid of all devices out of the bedroom. So I only read paper in the bedroom now. No oh, devices wow. in the bedroom. Well, yeah, that's that's been a game changer to get me about an hour and a half, usually more sleep than I was getting in December. So oh, I definitely. would advise no, that I, strongly. Only paper in the bedroom. <laughs> no, I don't touch the phone from like the early evening on. But the Kindle is great because I can, you know, read at night it's well lit it's easy to read i know uh, i don't all of that. go anywhere else on the kindle just i know book. all of that just all i'm book. telling you is what he told me it's going to keep you awake you know the blue light that's in there is going to keep you awake unless you're wearing blue block or sunglasses when you're reading your kindle <laughs> it's actually gonna it's gonna make you go hmm, i'm awake now <laughs> <laughs> so there you go but that's that's just uh it's just i just you, you know i I think there are no accidents and I think God put us together for a reason, reasons for you and reasons for me. But, you know, you've um, you've helped solidify some of the paths that I'm on. And for that, I'm grateful. And it's brilliant uh, to be speaking to a brilliant man. So brilliant, as the Brits like to say, that was brilliant. I love it. Well, it's been a pleasure, Nikki. Thank you so much for coming on the show. And that wraps up another exciting episode of the podcast, The Thought Leader Revolution. To find out more about today's extraordinary and brilliant guest, the one and only Jeff Greenfield, go to the show notes at thethoughtleaderrevolution.com or wherever you happen to listen to this podcast. Until next time, goodbye. This episode has been brought to you by eCircleAcademy.com, the proven system to add six to seven figures a year to your thought leader practice.